2K3 viewers, 2K3 Seastra. Hope this is working. Good evening. This is VK3 VR, uh, <laughs> VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Narriwarren South we are broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and uh, also on Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV in full HD and uh, also via the YouTube stream uh, which uh, can be found uh, on typing VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine and uh, look for the live uh, symbol. There's a, 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 as usual, there's a, a number of images and graphics uh, for tonight's broadcast. Uh, so if you can tune into uh, the YouTube stream at least. Uh, apologies for the delay between what goes to air on 80 metres in real time to what will be seen on the YouTube channel. Can't help bad luck. But uh, yes, there's, uh, having said that though, if you're able to receive uh, the RTV repeater, then that's pretty much near enough to real time. Um, anyway, there's a, a number of images as usual, and uh, I'll try to remember to place them up as I go through the uh, articles. Anyway, um, we also have a, an active email address for the station, vk3ekh at bigpond3 at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com, and uh, we also have a Discord chat window, uh, which can be found via the ASV website uh, at www.asv.org.au. And uh, we'll just type in the Astronomical Society of Victoria in your favourite search engine and uh, go to the Radio Astronomy tab at the top of the page and click on that and there'll be a little pull down box which will go straight to the ASV broadcast, radio broadcast. Okay, um, just doing a, something a little bit different with the audio tonight. Um, I hope uh, the audio level on YouTube in fact is okay. Uh, we're just playing around with uh, an AGC feature within vMix and I'm hoping that uh, that works for uh, everything. <laughs> variety of issues that we've had here lately. We still don't have a simulcast on uh, 160 metres. Um, the uh, logistics in, in getting a transmitter operating and um, Getting audio leads fixed up hasn't quite occurred yet. So, and the other icon box is still off air. I haven't pulled it out of its hole yet to investigate what blew up. So uh, we're still off 160 as I speak. All right, we've got Martin VK7JAH and Steve VK3SBX that have joined the chat window. Good day, guys. Uh, and uh, nobody's uh, sent any emails in yet on the email chat, chat email email address thing. All right, let's try to get into the swing of it um, and to see how we go. Firstly, uh, for those who are tuning in for the first time, uh, the Astronomical Society, which this broadcast is on behalf of and has been running since 1988, with, um, uh, with um, Russell, VK3DRW, who was the uh, station operator there for the first 20 years. Uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and uh, comprises over 1,600 members scattered about Victoria and Australia, overseas as well. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy and uh, the Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy 
and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month except in January, uh, with the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm Moyer Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available at Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The meeting, the monthly meeting, um, starts, like, as I said, to pretty much right on the login, 8pm, and uh, the aim is to finish around 10 o'clock, so it's just a couple of hours and uh, then you can be on your way home. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, peer articles and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. The receipt of the ASC magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like. And the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph for housed at the observatory which are accessible to members too. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loans so members can try before they buy. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, uh, the larger two with appropriate training. These range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the site is a 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to do uh, uh, willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities for activities catered for within the society. Uh, other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral meteor, comet, radio astronomy. Uh, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and, uh, and notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletins which are email publications that come out every other week sent to members. Uh, please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASC events may be required to be cancelled, moved or otherwise postponed. If you wish to uh, send a, a normal mail to the ASV, you can write to the Secretary, uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. Uh, otherwise visit the ASV website uh, at www dot asv dot org dot au and all will be revealed and uh, in fact I uh, should he have here a uh, uh, the actual website is available to look at on the site here I can just do that yep there it is and that's what it looks like um, for those that are watching the visions that's the home page of uh, the ASV and uh, with the revolving banner and uh, and there's also um, <coughs> an event coming up which I'll just bring up on the screen just there there it is uh, I believe tickets are still available and Messier Star Party, what we refer to as the Messier Star Party, uh, which is happening on the 15th of March, I think it is. So the printing's a bit small there. But uh, actually, I should be able to just have a quick look at it here on my main page. That's a big, big bit better. Um, yes, yeah, so the 18th of March, sorry. 
Uh, so the, the, the date for the Messier Star Party is the 18th of March, uh, with basically with uh, arrivals starting from 2pm in the afternoon. Now, they do have public tickets available, I believe. Um, as If you go to the ASV website, which is what's on the screen right now, uh, you can see the indication of a book now it's in, in, a, in a square there. So um, you should be able to uh, to click on that to be able to uh, to see whether any any tickets are still available um, to pop up. Uh, but once you've done that, then um, you, of course you'll be able to find out uh, how to get there and all that sort of stuff. So the Messier Star Party has been going for quite some time, and uh, uh, the uh, em- em- uh, the emphasis is of course to uh, to bring your telescope up there and. Um, try and uh, identify as many messier objects in the sky uh, as possible on the night and uh, providing the sky is not cloudy. Anyway, it's going to be a good day. Um, You'll be able to uh, go over to the radio astronomy setup and be given a a tour of the the dish and the premises and what's what's been going on up there. Um, And of course there'll be tours of of the site in general um, as well. Um, So um, tag along on one of those little groups and uh, you'll be able to find out what's been happening up at the ASV. So that's scheduled for the 18th of March. Anyway, just like I say, just go to the ASV website and uh, have a peruse and, and uh, have a, a click and uh, see what uh, what happens. All right. Um. Okay. Um, what else? There was something else I was going to throw in there, but I just can't think of it right now. Anyway, um, the next thing I'll just finish off is a few, the remainder of Tanny Hill's uh, dates uh, on this day date. So I'll just finish off the rest of that little list. There's only a few more dates there that I didn't finish, um, didn't start last week. Try not to sneeze. Um, okay, so. Uh, I can't remember the last date I mentioned, but anyway, I'll kick it off. Uh, it's the 10th, so... Uh, uh, yeah, I might have mentioned that, okay. Um, on the 23rd uh, of March 2001, uh, Russian former USSR space station Mir, which stands for peace, is destroyed in its planned re-entry to Earth's atmosphere. Also on the 23rd of March 1912, birth of Werner von Braun, famous for leading German rocketry in World War II and a key figure in the US space program until the 1970s. On the 24th of March 1965, Ranger 9 USA sends first television of the moon before crash landing. On the 25th of March 1655, uh, Christian Huygens discovers Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. On the 27th of March 1969, Mariner 7 USA is launched to Mars. On the 29th of March 1974, the first flyby of Mercury by Mariner 10. And on the 30th of March in the year 240 BC, the closest approach to the Sun in historical records of what is now called Comet Halley. And finally, on the 31st of March 1966, Luna 10 USSR becomes the first probe to orbit the Moon. Thanks, Tanya Hill for uh, compiling those dates on the stay dates for Sky Notes for this month. Um, Sky Notes is a fairly comprehensive list of what happens per month and like I say it's compiled by uh, Dr. Tanya Hill and uh, resident astronomer at the planetarium and a nice lady and uh, she compiles those notes every week so if you want to uh, follow up on Sky Notes. Um, just go to the Science Works uh, uh, site, and Planetarium, and just basically type in Sky Notes, really, and uh, you'll get there for more detailed information on that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, 
Hiko 3, Hiko, three, Hiko Kilo, Kilo Hotel. Hotel. Uh, coffee, 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 coffee. Alrighty then. Um, first article for tonight. And as uh, I think most of you know, any, any article I find that deals with radio astronomy, I'm always straight on it. That's, that's what not, I guess my first love is for uh, this area. Although we're, we're slowly working on the uh, optical side of it. Uh, welcome to Cassiopeia, Nibs, who's come up on the chat window. Uh, there's also a couple of you, uh, emails there. In fact, there's only just the one at the moment. Go, Dom. Thanks for your email. Great signal tonight on 80, 40. YouTube picture looks good. Audio has a little echo. Ah, echo. Echo, echo. There's a reason for that. Um, yes, there's a reason for that. And uh, I should be able to get rid of that. Harlow. Harlow. That might have fixed it, Dom. I haven't got my headphones on, so I'm not monitoring exactly, but I think I might have fixed that echo. I, normally, I have a little bit of feedback from my technical production manager, <laughs> uh, Richard VK3VRS, but um, uh, I think he Richard's gone to bed early tonight uh, because they're, uh, they're doing the um, uh, train and hobby show uh, this weekend, running Saturday, Sunday and Monday. It's a big deal, actually, a very, very, very big deal. And Richard's a key player in the uh, the train and hobby show. I think that's what it's called. And um, <clears throat> uh, in fact, there's a, a television set up. Uh, Peter VK3 BFG is organised for um, a cross from the hobby show to RTV. So for for all of Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, uh, the um, the show will be televised through Melbourne Television Repeater on bk 3 rtv one with a pause for the WA broadcast that I present on Sunday morning <laughs> for half an hour. Um, and uh, there's also, I believe, the ASV have got a solar telescope uh, setting up too. Um, I don't know much details about who it is and where it's going to be, but I have heard that the uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria is setting up a solar telescope for uh, for people to look through it, and the weather should be good so um, that's all happening this weekend and I think Richard's gone to bed early because of all that so <laughs> which is understandable anyway that was a bit of a plug for the train and hobby show um, I'm not really sure where it's being held uh, but uh, uh, it'll it'll no doubt be also put across on YouTube too I suspect uh, so, uh, having said that, um, I was going to segue into this article. Um, let me see. Uh, what was that? Somebody said something just then. Oh, Sandown Raceway. All right. Okay. Thank you. That sounds like Tony. Um, all right. So Sandown Raceway. Yes, there it is. That rings a bell too, actually. Okay, radio interference from satellites is threatening astronomy. And we've got a picture of the Green Bank Observatory here. So let me just uh, pop that up on the screen. I've got to keep an eye on my audio too while, when I do things like this. Okay, it still works. Good. All right, this article, uh, courtesy of astronomy.com. Uh, just as human development leads to more light pollution, increasing numbers of satellites are leading to more radio interference. And the picture is the radio, radio observatories, like the Green Bank Telescope, are in radio quiet zones that, pr that protect them f uh, from interference. That's the surrounding mountains. Visible light is just one part of the electromagnetic spectrum that astronomers use to study the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope was built to see infrared light. Other space telescopes capture X-ray images and observatories like the Green Bank Telescope, the Very Large Array and the Akakama Large Millimeter Array and dozens of other observatories around the world work at radio wavelengths. Radio telescopes are facing a problem. All satellites, whatever their function, use radio waves to transmit information to the surface of the Earth. Just as light pollution can hide a starry night sky, 
Radio transmissions can swamp out the radio waves astronomers use to learn about black holes, newly forming stars and the evolution of galaxies. We are three scientists who work in astronomy and wireless technology. With tens of thousands of satellites expected to go into orbit in the coming years and increasing use on the ground, the radio spectrum is getting crowded. Radio quiet zones, regions usually located in remote areas where ground-based radio transmissions are limited or prohibited, have protected radio astronomy in the past. As the problem of radio pollution continues to grow, scientists, engineers and policymakers will need to figure out how everyone can effectively share the limited range of radio frequencies. One solution that may have been working on for the past few years is to create a facility where astronomers and engineers can test new technologies to prevent radio interference from blocking out the night sky. And just at this point there is a, uh, a traditional image uh, of, the, of the way the spectrum looks. Um, I think we've all seen this image plenty of times, so that's part of the article. Different telescopes capture different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, with radio telescopes collecting radiation of, of the longest wavelengths, which is depicted in this image. Radio waves are the longest wavelength emissions on the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning that the distance between two peaks of the wave is relatively far apart. Radio telescopes collect radio waves in wavelengths from millimetre to metre wavelengths. Even if you are unfamiliar with radio telescopes, you have probably heard about some of the search they do, research they do. The fantastic first images of accretion disks around black holes, which I can show you, there it is. That was uh, a very popular image just uh, only a, about a year ago now. This is the, f the first direct image of a black hole that was created using the Event Horizon Telescope combining observations from eight radio telescopes. So, as I said, even if you un are unfamiliar with radio telescopes, uh, you, you probably have heard of the research that they do and the fantastic first images of the accretion disks around black holes were both produced by the Event Horizon Telescope. This telescope is a global network of eight radio telescopes and each of the individual telescopes that make up the Event Horizon Telescope is located in a place with very little radio frequency interference or IE, a radio quiet zone. A radio quiet zone is a region where ground-based transmitters like cell phone towers are required to lower their power levels so as not to affect sensitive radio equipment. The US has two such zones. The largest is the National Radio Quiet Zone which covers 13,000 square miles or 34,000 square kilometers mostly in West Virginia. It contains the Green Bank Observatory. The other, the Table Mountain Field Site and Radio Quiet Zone in Colorado, supports research by a number of federal agencies. Similar quiet zones are home to telescopes in Australia, South Africa and China. Now I've got another interesting image here to show. This is a more or less like a video. So let me see if I can bring this up and hopefully it will play. If I can find it. Um, okay where did I put it? Oh this is it. Yep sorry looking at the wrong thing. Okay now that should play. Okay, and I'll put it on a loop. It's on a loop. Yep, okay. Now, this video that's playing now, it should be playing now. There it goes. This is apparently real footage 
of Starlink satellites scooting across the sky. <laughs> I've, I've heard many stories from people telling me, oh, there was something we saw in the sky last night, a, a whole line of dots moving across the sky. Well, apparently that's what it looks like. I've, I've yet to see it, actually, but uh, I, I, if this video is not uh, doctored, no, I don't believe it is because I just saw a bird fly across the screen. Uh, so this is pretty real. This is what these blasted satellites look like. Going back to the article. A satellite boom. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik into orbit. As the small satellite circled the globe, amateur radio enthusiasts all over the world were able to pick up the radio signals. It was beaming back to Earth. Since that historic flight, wireless signals have become part of the, almost every aspect of modern life, from aircraft navigation to Wi-Fi. And there's a story attached to Wi-Fi that has a radio astronomy bent to it, but I won't go there yet. Anyway, and, uh, and of course the number of satellites has grown exponentially. The more radio transmissions there are, the more challenging it becomes to deal with the interference in radio quiet zones. Existing laws do not protect these zones from satellite transmitters, which can have devastating effects. In one example, transmissions from an Iridium satellite completely obscured the observations of a faint star made in a protected band allocated to radio astronomy. And there's another image now. I think we've all seen that video there. So there's just another image here which is associated with the article. And this is an even more interesting image. <clears throat> okay. So what we're looking at here Two images from the very large array in New Mexico show what a faint star looks like to a radio telescope without satellite interference. That's left. With satellite interference, look to your right. Now that's a, a big, big bloody difference. The left image is this faint radio object, distant star galaxy that they're looking at without radio interference yet however with radio interference when it's factored in is how the right image looks and it's a pretty busy sight to see continuing on with the article satellite internet networks like Starlink OneWeb and others will eventually be flying over every location on earth and transmitting radio waves down to the surface soon no location will be truly quiet for radio astronomy. The problem of radio interference is not new. In the 1980s, the Russian Global Navigation Satellite System, essentially the Soviet Union's version of GPS, began transmitting at a frequency that was officially protected for radio astronomy. Researchers recommended a number of fixes for this interference. By the time operators of the Russian navigation system agreed to change the transmitting frequency of satellites, a lot of harm had already been done due to the lack of testing and communication. Many satellites looked down at Earth using parts of the radio spectrum to monitor characteristics like surface soil moisture that are important for weather prediction and climate research. The frequencies they rely on are protected under international agreements, but are also under threat from radio interference. A recent study showed that a large fraction of NASA's soil moisture measurements experience interference from ground-based radar systems and consumer electronics. They are systems in place, or there are systems in place, to monitor and account for the interference. But avoiding the problem altogether through international communication and pre-launch testing would be a better option for astronomy. And there's just one more image here in this article. <clears throat> so what, uh, what you're looking at here 
is uh, radio telescopes uh, at the Akakama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. It's the highest location, one of the highest and dry locations on the Earth. And uh, these telescopes operate right up high in the microwave region. So uh, these areas uh, are far from any source of interference. But uh, a new site designed to test technologies and interference solutions could prevent future problems, as the article continues to say. So finally, solutions to a crowded radio spectrum. As the radio spectrum continues to get more crowded, users will have to share. This could involve sharing in time, in space or in frequency. Regardless of the specifics, solutions will need to be tested in a controlled environment. There are early signs of cooperation. The National Science Foundation and SpaceX recently announced an astronomy coordination agreement to benefit radio astronomy. Working with astronomers, engineers, software and wireless specialists and with the support of the National Science Foundation, NSF, we have been leading a series of workshops to develop what a national radio dynamic zone could provide. This zone would be similar to existing radio quiet zones covering a large area with restrictions on radio transmissions nearby. Unlike a quiet zone, the facility would be outfitted with sensitive spectrum monitors that would allow astronomers, satellite companies and technology developers to test receivers and transmitters together at large scales. The goal would be to support creative and co coordinative uses of the spectrum. For example, a zone established near a radio telescope could test schemes to provide broader bandwidth access for both active users like cell towers and passive users like radio telescopes. For a new paper our team just published, we spoke with users and regulators of the radio spectrum ranging from radio astronomers to satellite operators. We found that most agreed that a radio dynamic zone could help solve and potentially avoid any critical interference issues in the coming decades. Such a zone, uh, such a zone, ex such a zone doesn't exist yet, but our team and many people across the US are working to refine the concept so that radio astronomy, earth sensing satellites and government and commercial wireless systems can find ways to share the precious natural resource that is the radio spectrum. <laughs> Full stop. Uh, yes. Um, where's my picture? There it is. So, there you are. Uh, the, there's there's definitely uh, attempts out there to try and improve the situation. But, of course, ultimately, like the James Webb Space Telescope, if we can get a radio a telescope parked on the other side of the moon, we might be uh, might be uh, upping the the uh, the chances of uh, doing astronomy with little interference. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, coming from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Mary Warren South. Ho hum. Next article, at 26 minutes to 11 o'clock, uh, approaching comet predicted to shine brighter than the stars in the sky. Here we go again. 7th of March 2023, Science Alert. Do I have any pictures? Oh, yes, there are some pictures for this uh, article. Uh, make a note of a newly discovered comet with the lengthy name of C slash 2023 A3 Tushinshan Atlas. I think that's how you pronounce that other word. As it gets closer to the sun, our planet and our planet, it could shine brighter in Earth's night sky than many stars. The comet's nearest approach to the sun 
won't be until September 28, 2024. Plenty of time to get ready for it. Before hitting its closest point to Earth a few weeks later on, October 13, so you've got plenty of time to get your blanket and telescopes organised. That's just what I said. Though the estimates are extremely tentative at the moment, astronomers are predicting a brightness of magnitude 0.7 uh, at the comet's Perilithion. Keeping in mind that numbers lower on the magnitude scale represent brighter objects, with Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion at around 0.42 and Antares, the brightest star in the constellation Scorpio, a little dimmer at a touch over 1, magnitude 1. At its closest point to Earth, the comet's magnitude could reach an even more dazzling minus 0.2, which would make it one of the brightest objects in the night sky. Add in, add, add in the effects of forward scattering, where the dust and ice of the comet reflects the light from the sun, and we might even reach a magnitude minus five. Unless it's rendezvous, where the star doesn't rip it to shreds before it swings back out on its way into the solar system, that is, full stop. Now there's an there's a th image here that shows the discovery of the comet like a it's two two identical images but if you look at the um, where the cross is in the image <clears throat> that shows you that there is an object moving amongst the stars and this is how uh, comets and asteroids are found um, by doing these uh, comparative comparative images between one one or two images or so and what you're doing is looking for something that's moving So uh, that uh, those two images on the screen right now are showing exactly that, that there is an object moving amongst the sky. So it is worth bearing in mind that comet brightness is more diffuse than star brightness, as we're all talking about a moving object with potentially a tail rather than a single source of illumination. The best mo moments to view C slash 2023A3 should be in the days before or after October 13. It'll appear, it will appear in the dawn sky near the constellation Hydra and Crater. Th uh, though be warned, getting a good view in the glare of the sunrise might prove tricky. Astronomers first spotted C slash 2023A3 on January 9, 2023, not too long ago, from the Purple Mountain Observatory in China. It was then thought to be lost before being picked up again by the team of Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System Atlas Telescope in South Africa <laughs> on February 22. As a result, it gets both institute names in its own name. Tushinshan is Mandarin for Purple Mountain. The C is used for comets on an open trajectory, like likely to escape the sun's orbit. 2023 is, of course, the discovery year. And A3 shows this was the third object discovery in the first half of January. B is the second half of January, C is the first half of February, and so on. And there's just one more graphic here to show, associated with the article. Alright, so, um, yep, so that graphic on the screen at the moment is the orbit of C slash 2023 A3. It, it uh, can't be exactly predicted, they say, here, at the moment at least. Besides its notable brightness, C slash 2023 A is travelling particularly fast, about 290,000, 290,664 kilometres per hour, 
zooming along on an extended lap of the solar system calculated to take approximately 80,000 years, 80,660 80, years. Right now, it is somewhere between the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Stargazers should start to get good sightings of the comet in June 2024, though there's a lot of educated guesswork involved here. These celestial objects can be unpredictable in a way their paths develop, and scientists know little about this comet's properties. While the chances are good that we'll see C2023A3 shining bright in the sky next year, there's not much in the way of comparable comet data based on calculations uh, on, as such astronomers can't even say when or with certainty if the poor old ball of rock and ice will stay intact long enough to make its appointment with the sun. Despite the uncertainty, it's an exciting prospect for astronomers and we're likely to hear a lot more about C2023A3 over the months ahead. So there it is. We'll keep you all abreast of uh, what's uh, coming from that particular comet. You heard it here first on ASV Radio. G'day to Bill, the K3KHT, who's up there on the Discord. And Joe, the K3BKI. G'day, Joe. Yep, all right. And uh, Andrew has sent an email in. G'day, Andrew. All right. Next article. Yes, we've still got plenty of time here. <laughs> oh, dear. Um... What was next anyway? Oh yes, now this is this is a short article, but last week, if you recall, <laughs> that's yeah. If you ever watched Lost in Space, they ha- they had continuing episodes. The, the the very first thing that would be up on the screen was last week, if you recall. <laughs> Sorry, just going off on a tangent there. Rolling down the oh yeah, last week, if you recall. I mentioned something about the large and small Magellanic clouds and a very sinuous uh, connecting of hydrogen gas or hydrogen connecting both our sister galaxies and the Milky Way that was discovered with radio astronomy. I mentioned that. Even though the article I read it from, which I think was Tanya Hill Sky Notes, didn't make reference to the radio astronomy side of things, uh, but uh, I threw that in. Well, anyway, I came across an article. Um, in fact, somebody sent me the link on this. Somebody did. I can't remember who it was now. And uh, if this is off the Cornell Chronicle. It's called the Cornell Chronicle. Cornell University, founded in 1865. Anyway, so this is from the Cornell Education site, Education News site. In its title, Rolling Down the River, the Arecibo Observatory captures evidence of turbulence and thick gas as a possible precursor to galactic evolution, January 9, 2002. Washington, D.C., looking back. Washington, D.C., in a huge river of primordial horizon, hydrogen flowing from the neighbouring Magellanic clouds into our own Milky Way galaxy. Astronomers have discovered the first evidence of turbulence and concluded that the invisible hot mass of gas surrounding our galaxy is much thicker than physicists had previously thought. Galactic turbulence, an ingredient in the cosmic cloud and star formation, has never been seen in the starless regions of the cosmos before. What causes turbulence in a star-free cosmic stream is unclear, but this finding could be important in understanding the cosmic cloud and star formation processes, says Senzana Stani Murakarov, Ikvich. That's a name for you. And an astronomer at the National Astronomy and Ionospheric Center at Arecibo, Puerto Rico, which is operated by Cornell University, 
in a cooperative agreement with the National Science Foundation. The large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud are the Milky Way's closest gal galactic neighbours. Like the Milky Way, the Magellanic Clouds contain millions of stars and possibly planets. The Magellanic stream runs through the Magellanic Clouds and into the Milky Way. Ultra rich in hydrogen gas and surrounded by very hot uh, in, the, in the region of 1 million degrees Kelvin gas from the Milky Way's galactic halo. The, magnetic, sorry, the Magellanic stream is thought to be about 160,000 light years long. This means that it would take 160,000 years travelling at the speed of light to go from one end of the stream to the other. Using the radio telescope at Arecibo, astronomers have made rare direct observations of this Magellanic stream, which dips into the galactic halo, a thin veil of gas surrounding the Milky Way that is visible only through the radio spectrum. Only the magnetic... I keep wanting to say magnetic... Only the Magellanic stream's northern portion can be seen by the Arecibo Observatory. The astronomers analysed the hydrogen emission from the stream sections accessible to the Northern Hemisphere and found numerous comet-like clumps and filaments of gas, suggesting turmoil in the stream. While this is new research and the implications not yet fully understood, gas, uh, thanks to the Arecibo Radio Telescope, we are seeing this hydrogen gas in a sharper picture than ever before. Because of this, we have managed to derive the density of the galactic halo. This will be a factor in understanding the billion year process of galactic evolution, says Stany Marikovich. S-T-A-N-I-M-I-R-O-V-I-C Stany Marikovich, maybe. John Dickey, University of Minnesota Professor of Astronomy, who earned his PhD at Cornell 1977, Marco Carrillo, an undergraduate student at Colgate University and with Stanny Mitrovic, will present the poster Magellanic Stream Probes Density of the Galactic Halo on Jan 9 at the annual meeting of the American Astronomical Society at the Hilton Washington and Towers in Washington DC. While the Magellanic Clouds are quite visible from Earth's southern hemisphere, the Magellanic Stream, virtually invisible to the naked eye, can be observed only through radio telescopes from the southern hemisphere and from tropical regions of the northern hemisphere. Observers in those regions without telescopes can see the large Magellanic Cloud at about zero magnitude, which is bright. The small Magellanic Cloud is at a second magnitude, which is dim but bright enough to be seen in a dark sky. The famed, sorry, the famed Supernova 1987A, which surprised astronomers on Feb 24, 18, 1987, sorry, occurred in the large Magellanic Cloud. This research was funded in part by the National Science Foundation. So there you go. Our eight and a half meter radio telescope up at, uh, uh, at uh, LMRO, Heathcote, might have a chance of seeing that uh, gas cloud. Maybe. Anyway, <clears throat> now this article will go for about an hour, so I'm not going to read it all. <laughs> But it is a continuation of Arecibo. Uh, it, it is a recap, well not so much a recap, but a, an, a, an, ac an account of the day that the telescope collapsed with a little bit of filling. And uh, I've actually got a gift image here of, uh, from this article. Uh, this should play. There it is. And I think I've got that on a loop. Yep. 
So just to kick this article off, <laughs> um, it's it's um, it's an article from uh, a site called ScienceLine.org. That's one word, ScienceLine, ScienceLine.org. The shortest distance between you and science. Uh, and this particular article, which was printed February 28, 2023, it's titled, The Major Hole Left Behind in the Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico. The loss of the iconic Arecibo telescope is a massive blow, but not in the way you may think. Christina Brum, B-R-U-M, was there when it collapsed. She, he or she, I'm not sure if it's a she or he, Christina, probably a girl. Uh, it sounded like a train passing, and then the rocks from that tower, Brum said, pointing up at a nearby hill, started to come this way like a shower. I heard burr, and then with little rocks hitting my roof here, she says. We were standing in the humid hilly forest of the northwestern Puerto Rico, a couple of hundred yards from the rim of the now defunct telescope. Brum is an, an atmospheric scientist at the Deputy Director of Science Operations at the Arecibo Observatory. Oh, it's a, it's a bloke. He hails from Brazil and has worked at an observatory for more than a decade. He says, As rocks fell on the roof of the shed where Broom was working, he quickly ducked into the larger research building nearby and checked that all on-site staffers were safe. Luckily, they were, though a nearby car got pretty banged up by a falling debris. That was around 8am on December 1, 2020. That morning, a failure of support cables following lesser two cable breaks in the months prior caused the Arecibo telescope 900-tonne receiver platform to come crashing down upon its iconic 1,000-foot diameter dish. A large swath of the dish was destroyed, as were the upper portions of the concrete towers that held the receiver aloft. A recent analysis by the engineering consulting firm Thornton Tomasetti commissioned by the National Science Foundation, which owns and funds the Arecibo Observatory, blamed the collapse on a number of factors that largely amount to mechanical stress, exacerbated by natural disasters like Hurricane Maria in 2017 and earthquakes in early 2020. In fact, there was an earthquake the very day that uh, the structure collapsed. In fact, the earth, there was an earthquake a few hundred kilometres away. This is not the article, by the way. This is me rambling here. Um, there was an earthquake that occurred about four minutes uh, before the structure uh, fell. And uh, whether the two are related is... Uh, well, they haven't really pinpointed that, but um, there it is. That's my observation, at least. Getting back to the article, keeping an eye on the time here. I'm just going to really make this short, I think. Um... So, um, mechanical stress exacerbated by natural disasters like earthquakes. Uh, thanks to many years of strain and one final uh, calamitous collapse, what had once been the world's largest single-dish telescope became a shattered heap. In October 2022, the NSF announced that it would not fund the reconstruction of the Arecibo telescope nor offer operational funding for the observatory's other research instruments like its 39-foot diameter radio telescope or the LIDAR facility that studies atmospheric uh, atmosphere using lasers. Instead, the NSF will locate, allocate $5 million over five years for a new science education and outreach centre at the site. Following this announcement, many might assume that the biggest blow to science was the loss of a highly sensitive radio telescope, a massive structure capable of detecting the universe's faintest radio signals. This would be a mistake. In many ways, the Arecibo's radio capabilities were outclassed by other telescopes years before its collapse in 2020. The true blow to science came from the Arecibo's telescope's other lesser-known capability, radar astronomy. While radio telescopes are common, Radar telescopes are rare, and Arecibo was arguably the world's best source of radar data on objects within the solar system. And the final loss was not a scientific one at all, but a cultural one. Arecibo played a tremendous role in getting people engaged with science, 
for young Puerto Ricans in particular, it showed the cutting-edge research could be performed right in their backyard. So I'm going to leave that there. Um, the article goes on for quite a bit more with various other images. Uh, I don't know, I might even make it a part two next week perhaps. Um, we might do that. But uh, if you're interested in cutting, uh, following up on that article, like I say, it's a, it's an article that can be found on a website called scienceline.org and just type in uh, the major hole left behind in Puerto Rico. Okay, uh, next I'm going to fill in, this, this won't take long I don't think, this is kind of, it's about five minutes worth I suppose. But anyway, this is, this is just brief. This was published just 15 hours ago. Courtesy of Space.com Wormholes might bend light like black holes do. And <laughs> sounds like a rap song, doesn't it? Wormholes might bend light like black holes do. And what could be the key to finding them, full stop? And there's a little graphic here. I'll just show this artist's impression. That'll do. That's beautiful enough for those watching TV. <laughs> if wormholes exist, they might magnify distant objects according to Einstein's theory of relativity, and that makes it possible for us to find them, new research suggests. What you're seeing on the screen is an illustration of a theoretical, theoretical wormhole tunneling through space-time. Science fiction has made good use of these wormholes, i.e. Star Trek. If, wormhole, if wormholes exist, they would magnify the light of distance objects by up to 100,000 times, and that could be a key to finding them. Wormholes are theoretical funnel-shaped portholes through the, which matter or other, perhaps, spacecraft could travel great distances. To imagine a wormhole, suppose all the universe were a sheet of paper, and if your starting point were a dot at the top of the sheet and your destination were a dot at the bottom of the sheet the wormhole would would appear if you folded the sheet of paper so that the two dots met you could transverse the entire sheet in an instance rather than traveling the entire length of the sheet Wormholes have never been proven to exist, but physicists have nonetheless spent decades theorizing what these exotic objects might look and how they might behave. In their new paper, the researchers built a model to simulate an electrically charged sepher spherical wormhole and its effects on the universe around it. The researchers wanted to find out whether wormholes could be detectable by their observ observed effects on their surroundings. Their research was published Jan 19 in the journal Physics Physical Review D. The researchers' model shows that wormholes, should they exist, could be massive enough to trigger one aspect of Einstein's theory of relativity, that extremely massive star objects behind... sorry that extremely massive objects bend the fabric of space-time to such a degree that they cause light to curve. This bent light magnifies whatever lurks behind the massive object, as seen from our perspective on Earth. This phenomenon is known as microlensing, and it allows scientists to use massive objects like galaxies and black holes to view extremely distant objects like stars and galaxies from the early universe. In the paper, the researchers argue that wormholes like black holes would be massive enough to magnify distant objects behind them. The, ma the magnification via the distortion by a wormhole can be very large, which could be tested one day, lead author said. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the author uh, also noted that wormholes would magnify objects differently than black holes do, meaning scientists could distinguish the two. For example, microlensing via a black hole is known to produce four major mirror, four mirror mi images of the objects behind it. Microlensing via a wormhole, on the other hand, would produce three images, two dim ones and one very bright one, <laughs> the author's simulations showed. <laughs> dim-witted, sorry. However, because other objects like galaxies, black holes and stars also produce microlensing effect, 
Finding a wormhole with no clear clues about where to start looking would be a difficult undertaking. Uh, Andreas Karch, a physicist at the University of Texas at Austin who was not involved in the study, told Live Science in an email. Trying to tease out the microlensing caused by a wormhole versus other large objects would be like trying to make out the soft voice of a single person in the middle of a rock concert. They also noted that that while the paper authors offered an interesting theoretical way to identify wormholes, they don't even talk about how to do this in practice yet. That's future work. Although wormholes are still solidly theoretical, the fact that the researcher's model could one day be tested is the dream of most physicists, Lou said. Okay, so there it is, short and sweet, and uh, a little bit of uh, an update on On wormholes. All very interesting stuff. All right, let's just go straight into spaceweather.com. And... um, Ah, yes, there was another article here, and that's actually super short. Um, Just briefly, uh, there was a a picture taken by the Mars Curiosity rover uh, the other day. Actually, not the other day, but a couple of years ago. And it's only just been found, I gather. (laughs) Anyway, I'll bring this picture up quickly on the screen uh, for those watching video. What it is, snapshot, a feather-shaped cloud soars over Mars. The Curiosity rover captured images of a iridescent and radiant Martian skies as part of a recent cloud survey, March 9, 2023. NASA's Mars Curiosity rover added another feather to its cap after photographing wispy and colourful clouds on Mars building upon a cloud survey done in 2021. In the panoramic mosaic photo taken this month, the cloud's fluttery shape displays a colourful pattern caused by natural phenomenon known as iridescence. Irid, no, iridia, iridius science. No, it's iridescence. Oh, I think I said it right the first time. Iridescence. This occurrence is due to the diffraction of sunlight through small water droplets, or in this case, through small particles of dry ice, crea- creating a pastel sheen over an object. Where we see the iridescence, there it is, it means a cloud particle sizes are identical to their neighbours in each part of the cloud said Mark Lemon, uh, an atmospheric scientist with the Science Space Science Institute. By looking at colour transitions, we're seeing particle size changing across the cloud. That tells us about the way the cloud is evolving and how, it, how its uh, particles are changing size over time. And there's one more uh, image here that they got from uh, the surface. Just a few days later, the rover took another unique image of sunbeams peeking out from behind cloud formations, features known as uh, crepuscular rays. The contrast was enhanced in the image above, just to make it stand out. This is the first time that this type of light pattern was caught on Mars. Both images are part of a survey being conducted by January to mid, from mid January to mid March. The survey first began in 2021 and focused on studying nocturnal or night shining clouds. Martian clouds are often located some 60 kilometers above the ground and are usually filled with water ice. However, the clouds in these images are believed to reside higher in the atmosphere. And in that case, the beautiful clouds pictured here are most likely made from frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice. Curiosity was launched to the planet in 2011 with the goal of studying Martian environments and geology, uh, as well as searching for biomarkers suggestive of past or present life on the red planet. Anyway, so there it is. Very interesting images there taken from the surface of Mars. Most taining indeed. Very briefly, spaceweather.com. The solar wind is currently at 402.4 kilometres a second at a density of 5 protons per cubic centimetre. 
the solar sun uh, currently is sporting several sunspots. Uh, there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There are 11 sunspots on the disk of the sun as we speak. And there it is. That's the current image coming through. And uh, sunspot number is 155. The radio sun, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres, is currently at 179 solar flux units. That's pretty high. Uh, the KP index, the planetary K index, uh, currently KP is equal to 2.33, considered quiet. The 24-hour max KP figure is 4, considered unsettled. And the current Aurora Australis, uh, did I put that image in there? I know I've got it there. Um, let me just uh, quickly check where I've put that. I did uh, grab it, there it is. And here it comes. All right, so for those watching VK3RTV and uh, YouTube, that is the current Aurora uh, the amount of aurora activity over the South Pole, not a whole lot to be writing home to about. So, the any any aurora effects at the moment are very minimal. I would say, going by that image there. Uh, okay, um, now continuing on with uh, solar weather. Um, This picture that you're seeing on the screen now, months of sunspots. In February 2023 was a busy month on the sun, with the average sunspot number crackling 100 for only the third time since 2014. To illustrate this development, a fellow in Turkey uh, stacked 28 daily sun images from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory to create a February montage. montage. Uh, so that's what's on the screen right now. Uh, this single image shows every sunspot group in February. It includes every numbered active region from AR3203 to AR3238. So, you know, there's plenty of evidence there to suggest that we are peaking uh, on our solar cycle 25. There's uh, lots of activity going on with our sun. And there was also a CME, and I've got that image here, a GIF image, there it is. Um, a butterfly CME, they're calling it. A strange coronal mass ejection CME just left the sun. It unfolded like the wings of a butterfly. Oh yeah, it does, okay. Uh, <laughs> most CMEs look like a, a smoke ring or a halo. This one was different. Uh, we will never know what kind of explosion gave rise to its insectoid shape uh, because the blast site was on the far side of the sun. Uh, the sun itself is blocked by our view. The far side CME will not reach Earth, though. The gossamer wings will, however, strike Mercury on March 10, according to a NASA model. So there it is. That's a, uh, uh, an image picked up by the SOHO coronagraph. Um, very interesting stuff, isn't it? Okay. Um, and I think that's almost about it. I'll show you this. I tr try to show you this for those that haven't seen it before. This is where we are on the current solar cycle. So for those watching ATV and YouTube, um, <clears throat> where the yellow arrow is is currently where we are on the scheme of things of solar cycle 25. And uh, as you can see, it's peaking uh, um, fairly quickly. All right. Uh, I think that's about all I can bring up. Um, the current ca uh, count for near-Earth asteroids is 2,331. Potentially hazardous asteroids, 2,331. And I think that's about it for our spaceweather.com um oh report <laughs> just finishing my cup of coffee there Whew, okay well um, 
that's been a full hour and ten minutes so thank you very much Lee for uh, sticking in there tonight and uh, if there's anybody up at, uh, at Heathcote watching on the super screen in the uh, club room g'day to you uh, have a nice weekend and um, uh, again uh, if anybody's interested in going up to the Messier Star Party uh, there are apparently there are public tickets available and uh, but how many might be left I'm not 100% sure but just uh, go to the ASV website at www.asv.org.au look for the Messier Star Party uh, advertisement as such and uh, see if, uh, if anything's, anything's available for you on that note um, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station for the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night ASV broadcast, coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie, Sierra, Juliet, Nary Warren South, uh, concluding tonight's uh, broadcast. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, we shall now open up 3541 for any stations that wish to call in briefly. Uh, to report and I think the band noise is pretty quiet tonight so uh, hopefully we'll be able to hear uh, some uh, some of those weaker signals that might be there uh, I think we're ready this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 VK3 TJF VK3 Okay, acknowledging VK3JR, VK3VIN, VK3TJS, VK3TJS, VK37JAH, and VK3SPX. Anybody else? Barato. Take it away, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. VK3EKH, VK3JR, Good on you, Frank. <coughs> Happy birthday to you there, mate. VK3JR, VK3, EKH returning. Happy birthday indeed. And OK on uh, no missions tonight. <laughs> um, let's see, where's this uh, graphic again? Um, it's there in, on the YouTube thing. Oh, there it is, Femix. Well, um, if you look at the, uh, if you see this chart, uh, they've got this you are here yellow arrow pointing down on around about almost three quarters of the way up the trend line so they've got this trend line of where the peak for the, the solar cycle is and the very peak going by the trend the peak of that is July 2025. So the, where we are right now is February 23. And that is actually peaking at about, about three quarters of the way up that trend line. And it is already higher or, or pretty much at the same line. But it has peaked higher than what the trend is peaking for July 2025 <clears throat> so if that if the actual trend uh, is uh, continues to, uh, to to get any greater <clears throat> it almost looks as if it will definitely peak well above cycle 25 24 solar cycle 24 uh, by July next uh, 2025 so um, yeah so at the moment the actual the actual information being recorded is uh, a little bit more than halfway, but I'd say about three quarters there uh, along the trend line. Uh, but uh, but um, 
but showing much more activity uh, than what the trend line is indicating for this time of the year at this stage. So um, I hope that kind of uh, develops some sort of a, an idea in, in your in your mind there. Uh, Frank, uh, go ahead. No worries, mate. Good on you. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Again, happy birthday to you there, mate. Um, Ian, VK3 Victor India November, VK3 EKH. Yeah, good Queen. Happy birthday, Frank. And greetings to everyone else on the, uh, on the frequency tonight and the shortwave listeners. Well, oh, Frank, you beat me to my question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to ask you the same question, uh, Clint. So thank you for the, um, the, uh, description there. In VK3 VIN VK3 EKH. Yes, um, it is a long weekend. Uh, being uh, being back at work five times or uh, five days a week, full time. It's uh, it's now quite noticeable that uh, a five day week is uh, making my weekends only two days. <laughs> so when it comes to uh, a long weekend, I'm very pleased. So uh, yes, the the weather should be good this week. There'll be some localized showers occurring uh, particularly Sunday I believe but um, tomorrow and, and Monday should be uh, the best day that of this weekend so I might be able to finish some grass cutting hopefully um, but uh, yeah look you're, you're 20 over 9 uh, Ian uh, the this this uh, you know this gets <coughs> this gets recorded onto YouTube um, so you know people can watch uh, the, the, the program later which they do uh, but I've got a camera on the receiver transceiver and it show it's uh, when I when you're when the stations come up uh, I'm, I'm recording the, the signal strength so to speak on, on camera on a little USB camera so uh, you can review that you can fast forward all the nonsense and uh, and go straight to your uh, signal report there I've got it I've, I've got to try and patch the audio through because uh, I, I note that the uh, the sound pickup isn't very good um, when it comes to the callback side of it. So if I can just get a sample of audio, patch it through the mixer, everything would be sweet. So I must try and do that. It's just one of those things that takes forever to get around to do. <laughs> 
But no, you're 20 over 9, Ian. 20 over 9, and uh, just a little bit of QSP. But the band is quiet. It is surprisingly quiet. Across to you there, Jack. VK3 TEJS. VK3 EKH. Oh, VK3 EKH. This is VK3 TEJS. Thanks, Ian, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, That's joint, and... Uh, Yeah, thanks, Jack. VK3TJS in Shepparton. VK3EKH returning. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for uh, the kind words. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget uh, the, the very night uh, I found out about the Arecibo collapse. I was... Uh, it was, uh, it was first put on to <coughs> Facebook. Um, Arecibo has uh, their own uh, Facebook page. Yeah, I'll, I'll, well... Yeah. Anyway, that's when I noticed it because I, I immediately it was it was just two pictures. All, all that was available were two photographs before and after, and uh, taken from the same advantage point. So one one it was a, it was generally a lookout, and uh, the first shot showed all towers in place, and uh, the um, the platform nine hundred ton platform. Then the next photograph. Uh, taken some, uh, you know, not, not so long after the collapse, showed the towers obviously damaged, and the whole structure disappeared, and uh, some obvious other damage around. And uh, I was just in awe. I thought, I, I we, we all, you know, anybody following the Arecibo story, uh, we all knew that there, there was risk of this structure collapsing uh, at any stage. Um, so that's so the, the, the whole site had been cordoned off. Uh, so nobody uh, was, uh, except for official people, could be allowed anywhere near it because it was potentially going to collapse. And it was just so fortunate that the uh, uh, fellow had a uh, um, a drone up there. They had a drone. Um, taking footage inspecting all they were doing was in inspecting the cables for any more any more you know f filaments of the cable breaking <laughs> they, just, they just caught this thing going it was uh, really fortunate to, to be up there to capture it actually happening although mind you if the drone hadn't have been uh, up there at the time of collapse they actually had uh, a the other camera down in the uh, astronomers room the uh, little GoPro uh, camera recording it so they still would have got it on film anyway yeah but it's a bit of a pity uh, I, I was hoping if anything to go across there uh, one day um, just take a quick flight out <laughs> to Arecibo uh, apparently it's a bit of a journey but anyway I, I would have loved to have gone to that location it would have uh, it would have just been so amazing to see that structure uh, you know, and, and yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Next on the list is Martin, VK7JAH, uh, in Launch System, VK3EKH. Oh, 
No worries, uh, Jack. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Martin VK7JH VK3 EKH. Very good. Yep, good copy tonight. Um, I, I think that because the band noise is down a little bit, um, it helps. But uh, you're, you're hovering around 10 over 9, so uh, we'll be able to hear you fairly clearly. And uh, yes, agree about the telescope. So it, it's just a pity that the, the NSF um, uh, couldn't see fit to find funds somewhere to rebuild. The, the problem is though that the design was old. You know, it, it was designed back in the 60s. It was designed, its life was apparently only 10 years. Uh, the engineer who built it and uh, it was going to be just, yeah, 10 years. But uh, the uh, maintenance uh, on the, the telescope, yeah, there, there was maintenance, but it was often a bit of a, a band-aid sort of repair work. I mean, proper repair, repair work, but I mean, you're dealing with a mechanical structure that's, uh, it, it can, you know, a bit hard to work on. So, uh, it, it, it just would have cost a lot of money to try and uh, replace cables um, and to ex extend the life. But uh, no, unfortunately, it's, uh, its time was up. But fortunately, we do have other tele radio telescopes around the world, like the FAST telescope in China, uh, much bigger, similar design concept, but uh, a much bigger aperture. And that's doing great things. But it's not a radar. It wasn't a radar. It's just a receiver. And as the article said, uh, the, the 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 biggest thing that our receiver had in its favour was that it was a transmitter, that it could actually do radar astronomy, and it did that very well. So there it is. Anyway, thanks, Martin. Uh, it's VK3 SPX30, VK3 EKH. Uh, VK3 EKH, VK3 SPX. Hi, Clint, and hello, Frank.
No worries, uh, Steve. Oops, and that echoes back again. I know how, I know where it is. That's why it's happening. <laughs> oh dear, I got to keep an eye on because I'm, I'm using VMix, which is a big screen in front of me here. And uh, in fact, if I take the camera uh, off the stand here for those watching. Uh, video that's what I'm in front of that's my super super wide screen curved monitor um, and that's that's uh, vmix uh, that I'm using there and there's a little feature as I come down on the screen you'll see for those watching video the YouTube you'll see that that's what I've got to, that audio tab I've got to remain un, untagged uh, to stop that echo <coughs> So if I bring my mouse in and go click on that, oh, it's not going to do it. Hang on, I was looking at the wrong thing. Here we are. <laughs> Doing it on the wrong thing. Oh dear, how quickly we are fooled. Um, that, that echo will be back again. That's because that's ticked. So by unticking it, it gets rid of that echo. So I've just got to remember that. <clears throat> so there it is. Uh, shaky screen. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a good look, is it? All right, so there it is. Um, thanks, Steve. Good signal from you, and uh, thanks for the report. And uh, oh yes, um, I I'm not aware of any uh, any other facility that um, uh, has had the same capability. Oh, that it goes back again, doesn't it? Sorry, I don't know why that happened just then, but it did. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, so um, I don't know of any other capability, uh, any radio telescope that has transmitting capabilities. Generally, they don't. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, the thing that um, uh, made Arecibo, it, they had uh, several megawatts uh, um, to play with. And uh, I believe the frequency was in the 400 meg region. Uh, there was a a, uh, a specialized uh, antenna um, that hung off the structure a long uh, uh, very long antenna and uh, I believe that was the main transmitting antenna uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure but I think the frequency was around 400 megs anyway so uh, yes the it, it's a, a bit sad um, no I don't think there is I don't think there's any other facility available that has uh, has had has the has a radar capabilities like Arecibo did unfortunately uh, there was another question there um, yes no actually look there, there is another telescope there's a 39 I think it was 39 foot I'm not sure if it's 39 feet or metres. I did, I did actually read it out in the article. just can't remember right now. But uh, there is a, uh, a telescope that's used for uh, some uh, solar work, some minor radio astronomy, but mostly for something called LIDAR. Um, yeah, there is, there is still some research going on uh, up there. And the actual facilities uh, is still uh, being used by Puerto Ricans for uh, STEM work and for out uh, public outreach. So the Puerto Ricans are definitely making use of the facilities there, and um, it's not it hasn't totally been closed. And as the article indicated, uh, the National Science Foundation is. Uh, is uh, funding a million, basically a million dollars for the next five years, a million dollars a year for the next five years to uh, to keep the facility uh, turning over. Um, but they won't 
rebuild a telescope um, that's just money for that's just not available right now for such projects all right this is vk3 ekh again thanks for everybody who came up on the uh, email there andrew don um thank you uh to martin cassiopeia uh bill kht uh joe mr bki and oops wrong mouse um and i think there's a few others there <coughs> steve yep just a small group up there on uh, chat window thanks for joining us there so uh, we'll see you all next friday have a nice long weekend uh, and uh, take it easy look after yourselves and uh, we'll see you next friday this is vk3 ekh the official station of the astronomical society of victoria concluding transmissions here on 3541 uh, and on YouTube and uh, we'll catch you all next week take care alright so we shall cease and desist on YouTube and uh, thank you for watching the YouTube stream if you feel like subscribing do so and uh, whatever <laughs> the next broadcast from here will be Sunday morning uh, I do the WIA broadcast courtesy of Bevan VK5BD he puts a lot of effort into his visual representation for that 30 minutes a 30 minute program so I'm quite happy to uh, pick it up and show it on Sunday morning over our TV and also um, on the YouTube channel but the repeater is going to be fully occupied by the train and hobby show this weekend and I wish all the guys that are uh, that have um, volunteered uh, to have a good time um, and I'm, I'll, I'll be running the camera uh, the TV here for sure and uh, keeping tabs of uh, all the activities that are going on at uh, at the train and hobby show it's a big do uh, Richard VK3 VRS is uh, a key player to how that all works out but uh, anyway um, it should be good so uh, on that note we shall conclude our youtube stream and uh, bid everybody a very pleasant evening at 22 minutes to midnight melbourne time and we shall say cheers for now this is asv radio over and out where's the fade button oh there it is And, of course, the audio is still there. Ah, uh, well. What do I do to get rid of the audio? Um, it should have faded with the vision. <sighs> it's always something. Hmm. Maybe this one will get rid of the audio. <laughs>